All right. I am here with Trisha Price, Chief Product Officer at Pendo. So great to have you here today. Nice to be here, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise. Um, you know, I, I, I those who know me know that that um, I'm really big into product and um, product and analytics have been a big part of my career. So I'm really happy to dig in with you today about um, the work that you do to help um, companies build better product experiences. Um, but I'd love to hear about you and your journey. Um, what made you fall in love with product and ultimately led you to be CPO at Pendo? Yeah. Well, I, um, I have a technical background. Um, I was actually a math major in undergraduate. And my first role out of college was as a software engineer. And, um, you know, I was working at a company called Eagle Investment Systems. Uh, it's outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, this was before product management was as much of a clear discipline and role as it is today. And so, of course, I was doing a little bit of everything, right? A little bit of like product management, a little bit of development, a little bit of QA. And um, we got on the whiteboard. It was me and a subject matter expert. And we were whiteboarding out this problem we were trying to solve. Um, it was around weighted average life calculations for mortgage-backed securities. And we we're, I know, delightful, right? <laughs> and I know this doesn't sound like it should be amazingly fun, but it was for me. And we were whiteboarding it out and it was really fun. And I came back to my cubicle to start writing code, right? After we had figured out the problem. And I sort of had this aha moment that the fun for me was being on the whiteboard, not so much writing the code itself. And I realized that what I really love is solving hard problems and um, you know, providing value to customers and that whole collaboration process and ideation process versus actually the, the implementation and writing the code itself. And so that sort of started my journey into uh, more of a true product role. Excellent. You know, I, I have a very similar journey. I've been an engineer my whole life as well. Um, went up the engineering track, became a CTO at a, at a startup and exactly coming to that whiteboard and being like, okay, I can write anything. I can write code about anything. Can we please figure out what it is we're trying to do here? What's the problem we're trying to solve? How? Because I was so tired of writing code and then having to rewrite it and throw it away and leave it on the shelf. Um, and, and so that made me fall in love with, with product as well. And ultimately, I turned into a product coach and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, as, as, as builders and as craftspeople, um, we want our work to be impactful and fulfilling and yeah, you got to get up to the whiteboard once in a while to do that. You do. Yeah. And, and that, you know, to your point about shelfware and, mm -hmm. and making sure you're building the right things and causing, you know, really, really driving outcomes and helping your customers. Um, I think that's to take the story even further about being able to be the CPO at Pendo right? Not only now am I a, a chief product officer and able to really drive the strategy in these whiteboard sessions, but now I'm able to give product people across the world the tools to make sure that their products aren't shelfware, um, which is mm -hmm. sort of sort of a meta type yeah. role, right? Yeah. To be the chief product officer, creating tools for product people. Um, but that has been a really exciting part of my journey and I'm happy to be here. That's amazing. It's funny. You said, you know, build the right things. So that's actually the title of my first book because I was so just frustrated and fed up with building the wrong things that uh, I wrote a book on it. And I joke that it's, it's, a, it's a big book. It's kind of, it was a, a workbook to accompany a course. And I say, it's big enough that I can beat people over the head with it if I need to. Um, but that's fantastic. So, so yeah, so let's talk about Pendo. I mean, obviously, you know, very, very well known. If, if you're in the product space, you know, most people know about Pendo, but uh, for a lot of especially founders and other um, technology leaders out there who maybe haven't heard of it, you know, who are your customers and, and how do you help them? Yeah, so um, Pendo is a platform and we help product managers really perfect the digital experience. 
mm-hmm. um, regardless of what kind of a product you're building, um, you know, B2C, B2B. Sometimes it's even product managers in the sense not of a SaaS company selling software, but product managers who might be creating a digital experience for a more traditional product like a financial institution um, mm-hmm. or even product managers that are helping create experiences for employees. Um, but Pendo is a platform to help um, product managers across these use cases really understand user behavior and be able to help make better decisions about how to change your product, how to invest in your product, and then to even use tools like in-app guides to help people with onboarding of your product, or we're about to also launch session replay so you can really inspect not just through the data, through paths and funnels and reports, but even actually be able to see how people are using your product. Cause you know, it's like, you can, what? People clicked on that, did that? I cannot believe it. That's not the way I ever designed it. So to actually even be able to inspect it. So it's truly a platform all the way across the product management lifecycle from ideation to validating and prioritizing your ideas, communicating your ideas through roadmaps, and then helping you through launch, get product market fit and sort of continuing to iterate across that life cycle. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I have experience with your platform as well. The thing that, um, so there's a lot of companies in this space that do the session replay and do event tracking and things like that, but they're very disparate and not well connected. And I yeah. think that's the thing that, that you guys do better than anybody is creating a cohesive understanding of, of the product experience. Yeah, I agree, Eric. And I think that's really important because, you know, to be able to trust the data, to really be able to get the signal from the noise, you need the the story to sort of string across those things mm-hmm. you mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. Like for example, if I'm looking at an, a, a verbatim from a group of NPS detractors, mm-hmm. right? And, and I'm seeing a sort of a theme in my NPS detractors and they're saying this, don't you wanna know if those people are experts and they've been using your product for a very long time or it's the first time they've ever used your product and then don't you want to know, is it the first time they've ever used your product at all or just this feature? And is their company a long time customer, but they're not? Because all of those nuances make the verbatim what they said in the detractor comment yeah. a different reaction and action to actually achieve your outcomes. And so for me, like I truly believe having the connected platform is the only way to achieve outcomes. Sure, you can see usage or event analytics to your point with a tool, or you can watch sessions with a tool, but you can't actually drive outcomes unless you can pull it all together and tell a story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I, I was a, a data scientist earlier in my career and that's kind of how I got into this. And so I built these really ridiculous systems to try to do this homegrown. And so one of the things as you mentioned is, hey, somebody gives us a piece of negative feedback, right? It might be through customer service, or it might be in the app or through an NPS survey, what have you. And so then it's like, well, okay, so can I connect this to the person or the to the customer's data and see, well, how are they using the product? But then how do I find other people that are like them? Because not yeah. everybody's going to fill out my MPS survey. But if I can say, well, this customer represents this swath of other customers, now I can zoom out and see, oh, look at all these customers that are maybe at risk of churning. Maybe there's something I can do to lean in there or something that I can take from them to try to you know, improve the product experience. But again, it's incredibly <laughs> difficult and, and painful um, when you're either building it yourself or you're trying to piecemeal things together. It, it is, Eric. And I think that AI is just going to make this even more magnified, mm-hmm. right? Because if you try to use AI, whether you're building your own, you know, machine learning models or, um, you know, we're building them for you, it doesn't really matter. But or, or you're trying to use open AI or one of the new LLMs that have come out. If if you're trying to like take every data set, right? Oh, let me get all my usage data. Let me get all my MPS verbatims. Let me get all my replays. And you're trying to, you know, polls and surveys that you've run in product. Like how in the world do you get all of that out into some sort of data lake or place mm-hmm. and then try to build AI and connect like you were saying 
it's really, really difficult to do. But when you have that all on one platform so you can see the threads through it, I think um, it makes AI a lot more valuable. Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and it's a it's a bit rough out there for, for startups these days. Um, you know, and there's been a lot of budget cuts. I, I work with, um, well, probably about 10 or 15 or so uh, companies right now. And a lot of them have had to let people go. And one of the areas that they're making cuts is in data is in that space of data. And that's really hard because that's like saying, you know, we're, we're, we're on a ship and we got to throw our navigator overboard. Right? Right. Like, well, we got, we got to see where we're going here. Um, and so then there's this opportunity again to, um, to leverage a platform, but the pushback that I get a lot of the times is, is it's, it's expensive. It's hard to implement. Um, it's difficult to know what to do or what to invest in at what stages. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe you can help me um, and, and help our audience here. Take us through kind of like the, you know, the life cycle of a startup from the early stages up through scale. And at what point should they, what would be the, the you know, the most valuable or highest priority things to invest in, in terms of, um, in terms of not just the analytics, but again, yeah. this sort of customer experience mapping. Well, I mean, look, when you, when you first launch a startup and, and I'm going to use the startup term a little bit loosely because I think mm -hmm. it can be a true startup like you're talking about, but also when you've got an incubator or sort of almost a startup or new product within a more established mm -hmm. company, I think it's mm -hmm. still a similar um, thought process, right? It, you got to get product market fit and you got to get usage. That's mm -hmm. number one, right? If you can't get, if you, you, you can't get product market fit without usage, but you can sometimes get usage without product market fit. It right. just doesn't last. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but those things are, are critical, right? In, in terms of getting to your next phase, getting to your next round of funding, starting to get ARR um, coming in or, or revenue coming in, depending on your business model. And so having that relentless focus on the outcomes that you're trying to drive mm -hmm. is incredibly mm -hmm. important. And to me, you got to bring that analytics in right from the start to really understand how people are using your product, but it's not helpful to have data. Mm -hmm. What's helpful is to know what outcome you're trying to drive and start to measure it. Like mm -hmm. for example, with our own free product, right? We have a, we have a free product of Pendo. Um, we, relentlessly track second week retention. Meaning if you used our product, we want to make sure that you're still using it on week two. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people, it may be hour two, it may be day two, right? It very much depends on the type of product you have, but it's not about measuring and the data. You can collect tons and tons of data. So what? People used this, they didn't use that. They didn't click on this thing I didn't expect, right? This particular feature. But, but what is your business goal you're trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And then relentlessly using the data to measure it and then using tools like in-app guidance to help nudge and drive because you can't always fix product on a dime. You, it takes time to innovate and validate your idea and design it properly, but you can pretty quickly use an in-app guide or in-app messaging to remind people, educate people and drive certain behavior. Um, so to me, it's right from the start, but it's all worthless if you don't know the outcome of what you're trying to measure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of folks that either, you know, they either get scared and they, they don't do anything at all, or they get a little too heavy handed with it. Right. And then, um, you know, you build something that's too complex and then it doesn't scale and it becomes a, a burden. So yeah, finding that, that right fit, I think is, um, is a, is a challenge, you know, and, and, yeah. and one that, uh, like you said, it's kind of not one size fits all. Um, Maybe, you know, I'd love to hear a, a, a customer success story or something where, you know, a, a company at, at some stage of growth, um, you know, obviously wasn't doing it the right way. And then they came to Pendo and then they figured things out. And, uh, and what are the results that came from that? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to start with a, a fairly non-traditional story, one you might not expect me to talk about. You probably expect me to talk about our lots and lots of SaaS customers that are on their growth and startup trajectory. But I'm going to talk about a traditional business, Morgan Stanley, mm. um, and um, how they used our product to focus on retention. I think right now um, in the economic cycle we're in, retention is on all of our minds, mm -hmm. right? And making sure we don't lose those hard-earned customers and that hard-earned revenue and, and that our reputation stays intact. 
And so Morgan Stanley, before they had Pendo, um, felt like they had a really good handle. Um, it This is one of their particular products um, on their ca- customer success and customer happiness. And they went into an RFP and they ended up losing one of their largest top customers that had never been yellow, that nobody ever thought, you know, was unhappy. And when they went back and really did their retrospective to figure out what happened and how did they lose this customer, one of the things they realized is of the new features they had put out in their product, the the customer had never adopted any of the new features for two years. And so they were essentially, even though it's SaaS and they're on the latest version of their product, their implementation looked the same as it had two years ago. And when they did the retrospective with the customer to find out why did they choose a competitor, they found out that the customer said there was too much manual process and they were having to do too much outside of their product. Mm -hmm. And what Morgan Stanley realized was that every, almost every single thing that the customer was doing outside of the product manually they actually had solved for with product releases. Morgan Stanley just didn't know about it and wasn't using them. And so they sort of had this like analytics aha moment and they implemented this happiness markers program, which is all about adoption of new features. And it's not just making sure that people log in and use your product, right? Because this is kind of what you're getting at before. It's not just measuring. It's like, what is the outcome you're measuring? Mm -hmm. They were using the product, But what they weren't doing is adopting new features. And so they started putting together customer by customer, especially for their largest customers, what are the happiness markers? And happiness markers, an example of that would be using new features that came out, right? Mm -hmm. Because customers today, our customers, they don't just expect the business case when they bought your product. They expect continuous innovation and continuous improvement as your partner. And so now it's all about making sure that their processes are continuing to get better. And and that's just a great example of how Morgan Stanley adopted sort of that product-led continuous innovation mindset um, on their journey with Pendo. That's really interesting. Yeah, because, you know, everybody just talks about Dow Mao, right? Just active users. Somebody's touching my product every day or every month or whatever. But if you're established in the market, then that might make you complacent because somebody's just putting up with it. Maybe you are solving an essential problem, but then as a competitor comes in and starts leapfrogging you, you're not going to see that until it starts to to tail off. That's that's really interesting. 